If you remember back um, uh, several weeks ago around Easter, we were preaching a sermon of, uh, that involved the, the lampstands in the book of Revelation, right? You all remember this? Today, we're going to be honing in and beginning a new series to try and start tightening up around the, in, around the instruction of, of the lampstands and, and around the instruction of the, of the seven letters to the seven churches. Now, we had chatted before about one of them. Today, we're going to begin to, to hone in on the next one, which is the, the church of Smyrna. Now, Smyrna, aside from having a, a really terrible name, had this issue going on where they were anxious. They were fearful. They were facing a lot of trials, and the Lord was writing to let them know that their trials were going to continue, but they were going to be continuing for a limited amount of time, and, and that if they were faithful in their trials, then the Lord would bless, and the Lord would help them. And so we, as God's people today, we're going to be understanding more and more about how we ought to endure in our times of trials from Jesus' letter to the church of Smyrna. I'm going to be starting in verse 8. And it says this, And the angel said to the church of Smyrna, Oh, excuse me, And, the, and to the angel of the church of Smyrna write, The words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear for what you are about to suffer. Notice that he doesn't say that you're not going to suffer. He doesn't say that the trials aren't coming. He says, don't be afraid of them. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for 10 days, you will have tribulation. Now, uh, we got to put this in the right context here, though, because if we just read prison, we're going to think our modern day prison system, which in some places can be pretty nice. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying prison is a fun vacation spot, not saying that, but it's nothing like what it was in these days. To be put away in prison in ancient times, if you did not have someone from the outside who was committed to come every single day and care for you, give you medical care, bring you food, take care, make sure that you had clothes. If someone didn't come each day to check on you and care for you while you were imprisoned, you would die. It was a terrible thing for them to endure. Terrible. And here they were about to go away for the next 10 days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He gives them a little picture of what some of them are going to be experiencing. Be faithful. Yes, be faithful even unto death, and you will receive the crown of life. Verse 11, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you that... You teach us by the power of your word, and I pray that you would continue to do so. May we be faithful to read and study and hear and heed it. And Father, may we be inspired by this church. May we know what it was that they endured. May we see it. May we accept it as a potential reality for ourselves as well. And may we be inspired by their faithfulness by Jesus' words, and by others in the history of the church. Lord, we love you, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I, just to give us a little bit of context here to help us understand really what's going on. But here we have a point in history where the Roman Empire and the Jews have made a deal, okay? They've made a deal to snuff out the Christians, and, and they're beginning to execute it. And so times at this point in history for the church in Smyrna are not good, okay? In fact, really, really bad. And they're getting ready to be, to be put away into torturous situations. The Roman centurions prided themselves on being able to torture a person within an inch of death without killing him. It was one of the, the high points of their careers, and so to go away, to be put away to prison, yes, they required outside care to stay alive if they were even allowed it. It would be a horrible, horrible experience for them and their lives in general. See, this is one of the reasons that the early church writings 
are so difficult to, to line up all the way. The, the Old Testament writings, the Old Testament books are super easy because they are, there's a very meticulous in their copying style. They were very careful in the way that they wrote things over. But during all the New Testament times and all the letters are being disseminated and all the copies were made, the church was busy running for its life. They were running for their lives. This is why the, the council that happened in around 350 AD that canonized the scriptures was so important because for the first 300 years of the church, they're running for their lives. They're desperately trying to fight and to stay alive. And the church in Smyrna is no exception to that. In fact, you could probably even argue that they're taking the bulk of the persecution. They have false witnesses coming against them. They have charges coming against them as, as insurrectionists. They're just here to rebel against the Roman Empire. Whenever the New Testament teaches clearly that uh, insofar as we should, as insofar as our governing authorities are not leading us to sin, we should joyfully submit to them and follow them. Christians should be great citizens insofar as we're not le being led into sin. They're being charged with idolatry. They're being charged with cannibalism. Isn't that ironic? <laughs> the pagans are doing this. They're being charged with atheism and incest and all these things. They were losing their homes. They were losing their resources. Their character was being assassinated in the public. The people who were beginning to follow Jesus were literally losing everything. And it would culminate in imprisonment and torture and death. Could you just imagine living in this society for just a moment? It's difficult for us, you know, to really get this all the way. But imagine, it wasn't that long in history where people were going through this. Imagine being Jewish, living in Nazi Germany during the, the apex of World War II, and wondering if tonight was the night when they were going to show up at the door and take you. Wondering if today was the day that your business was going to be taken from you, that your home was going to be seized. Wondering if, if it was your family who got put onto the cattle car last night, or if it was someone else. This is the type of fear that Smyrna is living with. And if something doesn't change in our culture, if something doesn't give in our world, in our country, this could very well be us in the next 50 to 100 years or sooner. I make the joke pretty often, but it's really not a joke. It's revival or bust. Y'all got it? If our country does not repent, if our leaders do not repent, we will be, your children will be, your grandchildren will be wondering if it's tonight that they're coming for them. It will happen. And this is why Christians can no longer have the luxury of remaining silent on serious issues and submission to the authority of God and, and problems going on in our governing sphere. This is the time. This is the last shot, I would argue, that we have to press the Bible forward. If you want to preserve something for your children, I'm not making this up. And so we as God's people look to Smyrna and hopefully we find a degree of courage. Let's ask some questions though. What are you afraid of? Don't answer. Just think. What are you afraid of? Is it, is it pain? Is it, I don't know, the dentist? I don't know. Is it, is it death itself? You're afraid of water? You're afraid of heights? You're afraid of loss of financial peace? What are you afraid of? I mean, what, what really sends the shivers up your spines? Maybe there's a, a better way to help everybody kind of figure this piece out. Your fears, whatever they might be, can fit into a handful of categories. They could be financial they could be relational, they could be physical, or it could be your reputation, okay? I'll just run through those again. Maybe that'll help you put some, put some proper categories in. Your fears can be summarized as financial, it can be relational, it can be physical, someone physically harming you, or it can be over your reputation. Maybe you can't name the exact fear that you're dealing with. Maybe you can't name the exact thing that you're terrified of happening to you, but maybe you can put it in the right category. Maybe you can figure out where it belongs. Jesus knows all of them, even if you don't. 
If you're in a situation right now where you, you know exactly what it is, to, uh, I know what mine is. <laughs> I am terrified of a torturous situation. I read Fox's Book of Martyrs whenever I was too young, <laughs> and those have hung with me. Those stories have hung fast. I, that's my fear. That's probably the biggest one that I've got. I don't know what yours may be, but those things exist. We need to be aware of what they are so that we can also be aware that Jesus knows them. This letter opens with four words. Letter to the church at Smyrna, did you remember? Go back in verse 9. I know your tribulation. No matter what you may go through, no matter what your fears may be, no matter what the trials are that you may endure, no matter what you're facing, Jesus looks at you and he says, I know, I know your fears. I know them. And if we just think back even to, to Psalm 23, the Lord's, the, 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 that particular piece, you know what I'm talking about? The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of what? death. He leads me to still waters and green pastures. That's not a coincidence. To the still waters and the green pastures, there's a shadow of death to walk through first. Are y'all following with me here? And it was no different for Jesus. Jesus who, who suffered in death for three days. Jesus who honestly suffered in life for 33 years before he went to suffer in death. Because Jesus was existing in glory in heaven itself with God himself, humbled himself to become like a man and suffered an existence among us. That's a suffering right there. And then he went even farther into, the, into, into death itself for three days for us. I know your tribulation, Jesus says. And he doesn't just say that. As a platitude, I know what you're dealing with. I know what you're facing. Sometimes we say that to one another as an empty promise, as an empty statement. I know exactly what you're dealing for. No, Jesus knows exactly what your fears are because he's lived them. He's lost his reputation. He's lost his financial peace. He has been tortured physically, and he has faced death. All of that for you. I know your tribulation. You have a shepherd who will lead you through the valley of the shadow of death into still waters, into green pastures, and he goes with you along the way. He knows the temptations you face. He knows the pains. He knows the fears that are common to all of us as we walk through. He knows our tribulation. Look at verse 10. Jesus says, for those of you who are afraid of pain, of physical pain, of, of suffering, of things like that, Jesus says, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, their suffering, remember, he promises in this particular passage that their suffering will have a, a beginning and an end. For them, it, it's, he said, it's going to last for about 10 days. It's going to last for about 10 days. But if you are faithful unto death, I will give you the crown of life. And, and we too, as God's people, for those of us who walk through suffering, you will endure it for, there will be a period of time. There will be a limited amount of time. The Lord puts constraints on it. You're not facing this suffering for eternity. He says it's going to be here for a moment. Jesus was in the tomb for three days, and then he rose again. Suffering is short. It's short. Amen? But glory is forever. See, this is what I'm talking about. The trajectory of human history is up and to the right. America might be a mess right now. No joke. <laughs> no joke. But the church is blowing up in other parts of the world. Faithfulness is exploding. And if you just watch, I watched it this morning just for some encouragement. Uh, if you just watch a time, lapse of the, a time lapse of the progression of Christianity across the world, you see the forward advance of the kingdom of Christ. You see it. You see it. It's inescapable. But there may be some suffering that we deal with as God's people. Jesus was in the tomb for three days, and he rose out of it. Suffering is temporary. Glory is forever. So let that perspective from Jesus help you whenever you go through difficult times. Are you afraid? Everybody is. You got fears that you're dealing with? Join the club. We all got them. We just got them in different categories. But Jesus has endured all of them. 
and they will be for a short period of time, and his promise is glory. He also says down in verse 11, look at verse 11 with me, he says, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Now, if you remember well, this particular theme appears throughout all the Bible, okay? Do you remember what Abraham, Abraham took his son up the mountain and he was going to sacrifice him. Why could Abraham do so with faith in his heart? Because he believed that God would raise Isaac up again. He said that clearly. He trusted the Lord. Job said that in, his, in this flesh I will see the Lord, and he was raised up out of his suffering. He was awaiting the promises of God. Jonah spent three days in the fish, only to be what? Spit out into newness of life. I would even argue that Jonah might have died in that process, but I, we'll have to talk more about that another time. Joseph was raised up from prison. All of creation, the heavens and the earth around us, will be and already is being raised up to newness of life, raised up from the dead. And the whole Bible talks about the point of Jesus' work, which is the future resurrection. You got it? That we all going to suffer, but the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. You understand what the second death is, right? That's, that's death in hell. That's the second death, Okay. The first death is the death, the physical death, the death that you die here on this earth. The second death is death and hell. The one who conquers will not be afraid, will not be hurt by the second death. And don't forget, go back to verse 8. These are all the words. It says the words of the first and the last. These are the words of Jesus himself. The one who reigns as king. The one who's in control of all of it. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be living in fear. Christ is the one who controls and directs history for all time. And we can instead trust him. Listen, I don't know how to say this well, so just bear with me for a moment, okay? I've been through some stuff, okay? And I love y'all and I know y'all, and I know that y'all been through some stuff too, okay? We all been through some stuff. But you know what the good news of the Lord is? that he brings us through every last moment of it. And he promises that he works it together for our good and his glory. Why therefore be afraid? You can trust him. In the depths of the darkest moments of your life, when all you have is fear and panic and worry and, oh no, what's going to happen? You can take comfort in that one moment that he directed every instant and moment of your life for his glory and for your good. And that your suffering is limited. It's, there's bookends to it. Do you all get it? No matter what, your suffering on this earth, your trials on this earth, your difficulty on this earth, it has bookends. And the Lord promises glory to those who are faithful to him. The darkest, deepest, hardest, most difficult trials of your life cannot be forever. It's impossible. And I know, you see, that's the lie of the enemy, isn't it? To where you get in it and you feel like it will never stop, right? You're in it and you feel like it'll never go away. That's the enemy working. Your trials have bookends. They cease. And while you're in the middle of them, they are purposed for the glory of God and for your good. And there is an eternal weight of glory on the other side of when it does end. Amen? It will not be forever. No matter what it is, it will not be forever. You want green pastures and still waters? Who doesn't? <laughs> he leads me by a green... We love to recite that part, but we forget that the first part says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are my God. Because the Lord is my God. So do you have physical suffering woes? Do you have, do you have any kind of anxiety associated with those things? Trust in the Lord. What if your fears are financial? Yeah, I got those too. What if your fears are financial? Oh, 
There's a season of each month where I have to pay the bills. Do y'all, do y'all, do any of y'all do this or is this just me? It might just be me. There's a season of the month where I have to pay the bills and I'm like, I really don't want to look at any of the numbers. <laughs> uh, I, I'm telling you. There's a serious source of anxiety in there. There's a source of fear in there. Oh, man. Do any of y'all identify with this? Do you have financial fears? But you're not the first one. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34 says this. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Did you hear that? People in Hebrew, the people to whom the letter of Hebrews is addressed to, it says, you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. <laughs> what? <laughs> I got to tell you, if somebody stole from me, I don't know about much joy in the next few minutes that I'm going to be happy, <laughs> to be completely honest. I don't see that. But the, he's, ta- he's teaching them, he's instructing them that they are doing right by saying, you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. And so people took from you. So what? They can't take eternity from you. So people stole from you. So what? They can't really take what matters. They can't really take your confidence in the Lord and the promise of your eternal glory. They can't do it. And verse 9 is interesting if you go back to our reading in Revelation. If you, verse 9 is very interesting. Because it talks about how they're suffering and they're enduring. But verse 9 says, but you are rich. In the middle of that verse, but you are rich. See, what's that about? How rich are we talking here, Jesus? <laughs> Romans chapter 8, verse 17. It says, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. You want to talk about rich? You don't even have categories for this. Can I just be completely honest? For the amount of wealth of your inheritance that you have waiting for you in glory, you can't even comprehend it. It's not even possible. Romans chapter 4 Verse 13, for the promise of Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. But pastor, that just means spiritually rich. Look me in the eyeballs, okay? No, it don't. Listen, this does not just mean soul richness. Okay, if the new heavens and the new earth are tangible places, which they are, right? You don't die and go float into some weird helix ethereal magic light ball thing like that's not what heaven is okay you don't get wings and just play a harp for the rest of your life heaven and earth the new heavens and the new earth are tangible and the promises of your inheritance in the new heavens and the new earth are exponential to what you had experienced in this life are you following with me here and it therefore is not just spiritual inheritance this is a real inheritance A true inheritance that the Lord has promised for you. Peter even says it's imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. A real place, (laughs) right? A real place with physical attributes. It's more tangible than we, we could. See, that's Gnosticism, all right? That's a heresy for us to believe things that, well, it's more like just a spiritual wealth. No, it's not. That's the separation of the physical and the spiritual. That's Gnosticism. That's a heresy. Don't believe that nonsense. The Bible teaches that it's real. That there are resources that God is holding for you that are imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven. What did Jesus say in the Beatitudes? What do the meek inherit? What do the meek inherit? It's like a spiritual, invisible earth. That's stupid. No, it's not. The meek inherit the earth. God's people in the new heavens and the new earth literally own it. That's resources. That's that's tangible things, objects of God. You're worried about your money now. Okay, listen. I love y'all. Where's my stuff? Oh, man. Okay, I have my knife. Look, look, I'm going to help y'all. Here's the deal. We stress out about this flash of time, don't we? You're going to live 80, 90, 100 years if you're lucky, right? But in the scope of eternity, 
That flash of time fits on the tip of this knife. And this is where we pour out all our worry and all our concerns, right here. In this idiot, you can't even see it, bro, because I keep this thing sharp. You can't even see it. But it's true. And this is where we pour out all our worry. And this is where we pour out all our fears. And this is where we lose sleep and have anxiety and all these kinds of things. When the Lord says, you will inherit a weight of glory with tangible resources and wealth beyond your wildest dreams for all eternity. And we're like, but today I might run out. I mean, shut up. God promises you this. Some of y'all got nervous when I took that knife out, didn't you? <laughs> y'all were waiting. Somebody just said they videoed it just in case. Yeah, okay. Y'all were waiting. He's going to cut himself. Watch. But it's true, though. You understand? We worry. We panic. We, we fear so much in just this glimmer. When the Lord promises us resources beyond our wildest dreams for the rest of time, The meek inherit the earth, the real, physical, tangible. Matthew chapter 19, verse 29. And honestly, okay, wait, hold on. I'm not moving on yet. Okay, hold on. I'm going off script, but you're going to be fine. Listen, that right there, that truth, should unlock a whole level of generosity in Christians, right? Take care of your family, pay your bills, provide an inheritance for your grandchildren. Those are all callings of a Christian, right? But beyond that, live generously. Live generously. Because the, the God of the Bible does promise too also that to those who live generously, those who care for those in need, the Lord actually promises to pour more blessings out on those people. Right? With the understanding of our inheritance and its security for all eternity, a real literal inheritance that we will never run out of and delight in, a long be generous. All right, Matthew chapter 19, verse 29. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake, my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Amen. So do not fear the IRS and their 80,000 new agents. You're going to be all right. Bro, why do you think they hired 80,000 new agents? You know, you know, look, you know. You know, it's going to be all right. Don't fear the audits. Don't fear the seizures. Don't fear the betrayals. Don't fear those who would steal from you. Don't feel the loss of your properties. Don't feel any of those things. There is a greater portion of inheritance coming your way. You see, this is why they could rejoice when their things were stolen, because they knew this promise and they held to it. They're taken from me. Sweet got a hundred X coming my way and they were waiting for it they knew it was going to happen and so they trusted the Lord all right last one maybe you fear the other things maybe it's not pain and suffering that you're fearing maybe it's not financial woes that you're fearing maybe it's something that fits into other categories maybe it's loss of reputation or slander or fear of what people think or image or or the optics or whatever verse 9 says I know your tribul tribulation and your poverty but you are rich and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 1 says, A good name is better than precious ointment. Christians, Christians, listen, okay? Christians have always faced accusation. Always. Since, since the beginning. Go read the prophets. Those poor prophets. You ever read Elijah? Man, poor Elijah. Like one faithful dude in all of Israel doing something. <laughs> Everybody else is hiding. Everybody else who's still faithful is running for it. There's this one guy, one guy who's holding on. And, that's, and he was mocked and ridiculed and, and he had to run for his life in some instances. Oh, it's terrible. But that was his, his calling. You see, this is what we as Christians are, are called to do. Our reputations will take a hit. If you are faithful to the Lord, you will not be liked by some people. You won't be. If you are proclaiming the truths of the Bible, especially to a culture that hates them, then some folks will not like you. And for many of us, 
Our hope, our delight is to be loved by others. And we got to repent. We got to repent. We must return to trusting in the Lord for our reputation's sake. Your name will take a hit. Your reputation will take a hit. Christians have always faced accusation and slander. Jesus faced false witnesses and a trial, a faux trial that happened in the middle of the night so nobody could come to it. You think you're better than Jesus? The same things will apply to us. But you have been purchased, right? You have been bought with a price, which means that your name's not your name. Your reputation's not your reputation. It's God's. And you can trust him with it. Listen, you got to ask yourself one question every day whenever you put your head on your pillow. Was I faithful? That's it. And for the rest of it, it will be what it will be. But was I faithful? And trust the Lord with the rest. Your name does not belong to you. It belongs to the Lord. You are his slave, his servant. It's his name that's written on your forehead. We receive his name. We are little Christs. We are Christians. And he was slandered. So will you be too? That's just it. That's just it. If you're being faithful, you will be ridiculed, mocked, and slandered by those around you. I'm not saying go looking for it. I'm not saying go kamikaze on somebody. That's not always the best strategy. Sometimes it's the only. I get it. But I do believe that we will take these hits. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. He will hold your name. He will preserve your reputation to the degree that he desires it should be preserved. Your job, your job is to be faithful. So what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? You afraid of loss of reputation? You afraid of financial woes? You afraid of pain, suffering, death? The Lord endured all of these things for you. The Lord walked through the valley of the shadow of death for you that we may be led by the good shepherd into the still waters, into the green pastures, into the inheritance that he has laid aside for us. May we trust him. All your suffering has been accomplished in Christ in an eternal sense. May we trust him in that regard. Let's pray.